Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Kitty and I'm an academic doctor in the UK. A couple months ago I passed the MRCS Part B OSCE exam and I've already shared my revision strategy and the specific resources that I used to study for the exam in another video. If you haven't already, I highly recommend watching that video first before this one for an explanation of the general format and content of the exam. Aside from general study tips though, part of being able to do well in the MRCS Part B is down to exam technique and understanding the format and expectations of individual stations, which is what I'm going to talk about today in this video. Essentially, I will be breaking down the exam into its various components, what the examination format is like and what to expect. For obvious reasons, I can't tell you exactly what was asked in my exam, um, but hopefully this video will give you a good idea of what you might be asked on the day and how to prepare for it. Before we start, I thought we'd just do a whistle-stop recap of what the MRCS Part B exam format is like. There are 17 exam stations in general, with at least two preparation stations and any additional rest stations. The stations will be set up in a circuit format, and for each station you have one minute of reading time outside the door with an instruction sheet, and nine minutes to go in and actually answer the questions or perform the exam. Each station is marked out of 20 marks and there's no negative marking, so if you don't know the answer, it is always worth a guess. Now that we've cleared that up, let's move on to the breakdown of each station. The applied knowledge component of the exam is relatively straightforward in that most stations are direct with a simple Q&A format. There's usually a set number of questions that the examiner has to go through with you and an associated mark scheme out of 20. Now, there's not always a full 20 questions to go through in these stations. Some more complex questions may be worth two points Points, so if you give a partially correct answer, you might still be able to score one point. A key tip from my own exam experience is that examiners are pretty happy for you to go back to questions that you weren't sure about in the first place. So if you would like some time to think, you can always ask to park the question for now and go back to it later. Obviously, this is with the caveat that you have enough time left over to revisit the question at the end. Similarly, there were also several times I realised I gave a wrong answer early in the station and examiners have allowed me to go back to the question and amend my answer at the time. There are three anatomy stations in the MRCS Part B exam and they're probably the most straightforward of the bunch because answers tend to be short, so there are often a full 20 questions in these stations. In the past, cadaveric specimens have been used, however, since the pandemic this has transitioned to the use of specimen pictures and I don't know if they would ever go back to having actual specimens. A large proportion of the opening questions were simply focused on identifying structures that the examiner either points at or names for you to identify on the specimen. This is then usually followed by questions related to the structure in the question, such as, um, you know, its blood and nervous supply if it's a muscle, its attachments, and of course, um, you know, the course of a nerve and the clinical sequelae if it's damaged. Relevant anatomical areas and its contents, like the femoral triangle and the opening of ducts and where they insert, are all common questions. The anatomy stations usually then end with a few clinically oriented questions as well, such as asking you to define pathologies uh, due to an underlying anatomical problem, for example, coarctation of the aorta, or the clinical significance of the course of a cranial nerve. As I mentioned in my previous video, the pathology stations tend to be a little bit more rogue, but the majority of questions are still relatively mainstream, so you can probably afford to lose a few points here, especially if you do well in the other stations. For the two pathology stages in the exam, you might get questions about the etiology of the condition, as well as risk factors and genetic mutations that are responsible for a variety of cancers, for example. There will also be at least a few questions on histological appearances as well, um, generally again for cancers, but this tends to be confined to the couple of mainstream sort of high yield cancers, if you like, or if you can say that, um, that you should definitely come across in your general revision. You might also be asked to stage the cancer based on a histology report using an appropriate staging system, but there's generally additional information to help you out so you don't have to recall the entire TNM or Dutes criteria by heart. You might also get asked about microbiology in terms of what bugs are likely responsible for certain infections, or a more cruel version would be getting a description of what an organism looks like and then you have to guess what it is. In this instance, the examiner would usually say something like, they have to take your first answer so you can't name a few things to guess. You may also have to be asked about investigations and management of the topic, which often seems to be more of a medical answer rather than a surgical one. The critical care stations are probably the more complex out of all the applied knowledge stations. There are generally three stations which can have a focus on trauma, 
and acutely and well patient as well as general surgical science and physiology. Critical care stations might be based on a stem that you have one minute, one minute, sorry, to read outside the room before you head in. For example, uh, an, a road traffic accident scenario or an unwell surgical patient on the ward. The first couple of questions of the station is likely to ask how you would manage this patient. So you need to have a good grasp of the ATLS and the CRISP principles to be able to confidently go through A to E, bearing in mind the specific investigations you might need to do for the patient, for example, a blood gas if they're short of breath, C-spine imaging and trauma scans for any trauma scenario, and your immediate management. Some questions might also relate to general principles of caring for surgical patients, for example, the use and administration of anaesthetics, considering the risk of anaesthesia and surgery, and pain management. The station will then usually focus on a topic of interest and explore your understanding of pathophysiology, um, for example, anywhere from um, the sequelae of a long bone fracture or a spinal injury to kind of biochemical changes like what would you expect the LFT to look like in this condition. Um, which is usually in the surgical sciences station. Moving on to the applied skills component, this is arguably where the exam technique is even more important than revision and knowledge. In a way, if you are able to have a good structure in how you tackle these stations, even if you are lacking in specific knowledge, you might still be able to pass the station. Additionally, communication is a huge part of these stations. And because of this, the applied skill stations are simultaneously difficult to fail but also difficult to score really well compared to the knowledge stations which are a lot more black and white. There are usually one or two practical skill stations in the exam. You will be told what tasks you have to carry out on the instructions outside of the room and in the ICPSC syllabus there is a list of procedures that you could be asked to do in the exam from inserting cannulas to doing chest drains. When you enter the room, the first thing you should do is check that the patient has consented to the procedure. A WHO checklist may not be apparent, and it is really essential to show your awareness of patient safety and consent, as a lot of these scenarios might say something like, your registrar has started this procedure, the patient's already anaesthetized, and you've been asked to carry out the rest of the procedure. Once you say this, the examiner will either ask you to move on if you don't need to do it, or you might have to check the patient's identity and go through the WHO checklist. After this, you will normally have to select the equipment you need for a procedure from a selection available on a table in the room. Make sure you do revise this carefully and double check that you have what you need. If possible, run through the procedure in your head and make sure you know what the different sutures do and pick an appropriate one. If you happen to select the wrong equipment, you will not be allowed to go back later and get it. So it is essential that you get all the instruments you need. Finally, you need to perform the procedure, obviously, after checking that the patient is happy. If they've had local anesthetic, make sure to test the skin with some forceps. So basically what you would do in real life and just make sure you're doing it in the kind of PC correct way taught in the basic surgical skills BSS course. So for example, no handling the needle with your hands, make sure you close the wounds with the one suture provided, make sure you're irrigating the one of is contaminated and make sure you go through all the steps sequentially. Something to note is that the patient actor might speak to you and ask questions as you do the procedure. So be prepared for this and try not to let you distract it from the task at hand. Another common station is ordering a surgical list for theatre. So usually three to four patients with varying urgency and operations with various medical problems and or allergies. Um, you will have one minute outside the station to read the patient list and this will also be available inside the station. Generally, you will be asked to prioritise the patients and explain your rationale to the examiner. So, for example, based on clinical urgency, based on the length of the procedure, allergies and infections, comorbidities like diabetes. Generally, a good rule would be starting the station by saying you want more information on the patient's clinical status because you don't know whether they're stable or unstable, um, which would obviously take priority. But otherwise, based on the information given to you, your choice would be X, Y, Z. Often there's no one right answer for the exact order of the list, but you will be scored for your reasoning for why you've ordered the list in a certain way. After deciding the order of the list, you might also need to explain specific considerations for each patient. So for example, if they have a latex allergy, then all theatre staff needs to be informed, they need to go first. If they can't have a monopolar diathermy because they have a pacemaker, if they need a sliding scale because they are diabetic, or if they need to go to HDU or ITU following the operation and you need to make that arrangement. There are two history taking stations in the exam. And again, you'll be given a short stem to read outside the room. 
In the room, there will be two examiners, usually one person looking at the clinical aspects and the other scoring you on communication, and of course the patient or actor that you will be taking the history from. Unlike the other station, an additional bell will ring at six minutes into the station. At this point, you will need to have finished taking the history and use the remaining three minutes to answer the examiner's questions. In terms of taking the history itself, as long as you have a really good structure, you're unlikely to lose a lot of points. Make sure that you do introduce yourself, check the patient's identity, and go through the presenting complaint, the past medical history, drug history, social history, and family history systematically, just like you did in medical school. Generally, the history is designed so that patients are not medically complex and like real life, so you should be able to get through it quite quickly. Finally, you want to end your history on asking about the patient's ideas, concerns and expectations or ICE, as there could be a hidden agenda or particular concern that you need to address to score full marks. If you finish taking your history before the full six minutes, you can inform the examiner and begin answering questions early. The questions following this tends to be quite formulaic from my own experience and, an and anecdotes from others. So usually you'll be asked to summarize the history as you would do to a consultant, give some differential diagnosis, discuss some investigations and management that you would do, which would be structured into conservative, conservative medical and surgical. There are three physical examination stations in the Part B exam, and this is similar to the history stations where, again, you would be expected to perform the examination in six minutes, answer some questions from the examiner with the remaining time. There is a stem for reading outside, which will have already outlined a bit about the history to suggest what examination you should do. In some cases, you might find that doing two examinations would be appropriate. For example, a vascular and peripheral neurology exam or an elbow and hand exam based on the history. You will not need to take a further history when in the room. I found these stations to be quite time pressured, so really make sure that you have practice enough to perform a slick examination on the day. Again, after six minutes, you will have to answer some questions from the examiner. These are also pretty straightforward, including summarising your findings, differentials, investigations and management. And occasionally, there might also be a question or two about the relevant anatomy or physiology. Finally, there are two communication stations in the MRCS exams, which focuses on receiving and giving information. These stations are usually preceded by a preparation stations where you have a full nine minutes in a quiet room to read through some material provided to you, for example, patient's notes and investigations. You'll be allowed to make notes and take it through to the actual exam station. My one tip here is that there can often be a lot of information provided to you here, so you might not have time to actually go through all of it in detail. So read the stem very carefully and pick out what is the most important information that you need. There are usually a couple of possible scenarios for the communication stations. You could either be dealing with a difficult patient or relative, gaining consent from a patient for a procedure, explaining a diagnosis or breaking bad news, and giving a handover or discussing about a patient to another medical colleague. For scenarios to speaking patients or relatives, there is really no one way to do it. Um, it is important to keep in mind key issues like capacity, consent, and patient safety in these scenarios and incorporate this where possible, and of course, maintain empathy empathy and professionalism in your interactions. Again, there, often there is a hidden agenda or concern that patients will raise and you will need to tease that out uh, from the information and address it to score top marks. What is probably most helpful to prepare for these stations is to read some past accounts, read through example stations in question banks like the past the MRCS and practice with somebody. Bear in mind, particularly for difficult scenarios like an angry patient, you may not be able to immediately resolve the problem or the patient's concerns within nine minutes, but that doesn't matter because as long as you have demonstrated consideration of the key principles and you've communicated well, you'll still be able to pass the exam and score well in the station. If you're ever unsure when you're speaking to a patient about where the consultation is going or what they want to achieve, try and use the ICE approach again. And often you can let the actor sort of lead you where the points are and they will often leave sort of um, little tips and marks about where the marks are and where you need to follow down that path. So let them lead you to where the marks are. For stations where you're giving information to a colleague, this will often be focused on a handover, discussion with a senior consultant specialist or requesting further care like transfer or admitting the patient to ITU. Sometimes this might not be face to face and there might be a simulated phone to use in the room or even a Zoom or Teams meeting on the laptop. Maintain a good SBAR structure in presenting information and summarise your notes from the previous preparation stations. Sometimes necessary investigations or information may not be available deliberately in the information that you are given about the patient. 
if asked about this, just be honest and say you don't have the information, but you will obtain it after the discussion with your colleague. Never lie, obviously, and make up an answer because this will probably lead to an immediate fail. Ensure that you know the criteria for admitting patients to HDU or ITU. So um, if you open with this, for example, that, oh, the patient needs to go to ITU to support two failing organ systems of a reversible course, you will basically prevent any immediate pushback in the exam because that is the criteria for admission to ITU. If the patient needs to be transferred um, to further care in another centre, ensure you consider whether the patient has been stabilised for transfer and whether further investigations are needed prior to this. And that's the end of the video. I hope that you have found this useful for your exam preparations. And again, for details about study resources I use, please do check out my previous video on the MRCS Part B if you haven't already. If you have any questions at all, please leave a comment below and don't forget to leave a thumbs up and subscribe for future content if you like the video. That's it for now and I'll see you next time.